You know, in the words of the great poets, Tony, Tony, Tony. Yeah, that's right. It's our anniversary, guys. You know this. Man, we are so excited about today. Um, as Anna and I were, you know, just talking about what this day would be like as I was just seeking the Lord about it today. I just feel like the Lord just told me, Sean, today is a day that you're going to get ministered to. So if you're here and you think I have something profound to say to you, no. <laughs> all right. Um, now, we're, we're excited about uh, today and all that, that God has done. 27 years. I mean, we are... We are adulting so hard right now, aren't we? 27 years. I was think, looking at this uh, this week. I was thinking, man, what, what, what's 27? Significance of 27. 27. Uh, it takes 27 days for the moon to revolve around the earth. A full revolution. I know. See, insight. Okay. <laughs> Google. Google. All right. Uh, it takes 27 days for the sun to revolve around its, uh, to, to revolve in its axis uh, one time. Uh, there's 27 bones in the human hand. Um, there, this one's gross. It takes 27 days for the, the outer cells of the human body to completely shed and regrow back. Okay, that's, that's why one's gross. Okay, um, 27 books in the New Testament. Here's another one in Hebrew. You want to hear uh, 27 in Hebrew? So uh, in Hebrew, 27 carries significance related to spiritual potential, purity, divine existence, and completeness. I don't know about you, but when I was 27, that's kind of when my family started looking at me and said, hey, come on, get it together. Okay? <laughs> get it. All right, you got to get mature now. Amen. So 27, this is a big, this is a big deal. Um, we're excited about what the Lord is doing uh, in this church um, and in your lives. Again, uh, being a leader of this community, uh, and I know Aaron would say the same, we just get an opportunity to, to do life with you guys and to see, uh, you know, th see the goods and the bads and everything in between. It's our honor to be able to walk uh, through life with you guys. And so here's what we want to do. Um, we, we are actually excited to cast some vision today. So what we're excited to kind of show you guys for about two years, uh, we have been working, Aaron and I and the, the elder team, uh, we've been working. We also kind of brought um, others, uh, other leaders in this just to kind of help us shape and think through uh, what God is saying, what God's doing here in this community. Uh, we're excited to share that with you. But first, we just wanted to take some time um, to just make this very real um, by just bringing some testimonies to you of what God is doing uh, in this house uh, and around the world through this ministry. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by inviting the first couple, right, the couple that showed up first, uh, the couple that if they were not here and persuaded, we wouldn't be here today. All right. And so what we're going to do is a, a testimony of history. So we're going to have Ken and Lydia Burks. They're going to come forward and just speak to us about what God's doing. Okay, well, I guess I'll start it out. <laughs> we were blessed to join the Rock when God moved on us after pastoring for 12 years. We actually had the Bonita building down the street. And I, I remember the conversation I had with my elders when we decided to sell. And it, our decision was we were not going to sell to anybody but somebody only somebody that could come in and really make a difference. And, and shortly after that, I heard through the grapevine that Pastor Francis, of course he was just Francis at that time, wanted to start a church in Roseville. And I had known him through the years. Actually, we had the same apostolic fathers that groomed us. We were in different streams, but our apostolic fathers floated back and forth. And so we had the same input into our lives, and I knew that he was a trustworthy person. I'd been to his seminars, Francis's, and knew what caliber of person he was. And so I sought him out and said, Francis, I have a building for you. I heard you wanted to start the church. And he jumped on it. And so here we are today after that. In 1997, Francis and Susie Anfuso were sent by Glad Tidings in Yuba City 
to plant a church in Roseville. Along with the team that came with them, Glad Tidings sent about 40 people a week to boost the attendance in the new church. At that time, there were about 30 or 40 of us just waiting for him to come. Because uh, Francis was a well-known name in the community. He had done conferences here in Sacramento. And so a lot of people knew about him and they were ready for him to start a church. And so with that, and plus about 40 people coming um, each week, different people, and then the team that came with him, we immediately had a church of about 70 people or so. And um, that's what got us started. And so we started with over almost 100 people on our first service on October 5th. It was October 5th, 1997 at 202 Bonita Street. So I'm really old school, and back in the day we had what was called a My Story, and you had to read it, and it was 600 words flat. Don't go over that. So I'm going to read. <laughs> so we were taught early on that every one of us offers a unique contribution to the body. Our motto was everyone gives, loves, serves, and honors. And it set the stage for members working together as a team. We really lived that. We had that on the back of our shirts. That was truly our motto. So Pastor Francis also set the tone towards unity of the faith with other churches throughout the city by always saying that the only person not allowed to leave the church was his wife, Susie. Everyone else should feel free to go where God calls them. He said that if you leave the church and you see him in the grocery store, you better not duck. You better come up and give him a warm hug. And so Francis, very early on, had the vision for interns to be raised up within the church. The Rock Intern Program was birthed in 1999, just two years after we started, with hundreds, hundreds of interns graduating over the years from our one to two year program. Living on site, you know those apartments that are right across the street? Um, the Rock leased all of those. Uh, and um, that's where our interns um, stayed during the school year. And so it was an on-site program with the apartments across Tuolto Bonita. And there I taught a class called Biblical Perspectives for 15 years to both uh, I think that the first years was just perspectives. The second years was, was more perspectives. <laughs> Basically, foundational truths, you know, in the Bible, getting people grounded in the Word of God. That's my passion, is getting people grounded in the Word of God. And so I taught that for 15 years in that program. I think it uh, wound down around 2014 or somewhere around there. And... Um, where am I at here? Okay. Number six. Okay. So then our church began to grow really quickly. And one of the things that we did is that um, Francis had, um, he was started a ministry called CEI, Christians. Um, Equipers International. There we go. <laughs> but anyway, he had written all these different track booklets, and one of them was called the two-question test. It was specifically designed to lead people to the Lord. And so what we did is and on Tuesday nights, market had begun at that time, we had a booth right down there in the middle of everything, and hundreds of people were coming to the booth. But the amazing thing was, is that after we started that, the church just doubled overnight. It was, it was an incredible thing. We went from like 75 to 100 people to 150 people, just like that. And it never stopped. It just kept progressing. And, and I, I think the Lord at that time was just testing our obedience to see how we were gonna respond to what he was calling us to do. And he just put his favor upon the Rock of Roseville. And it grew and grew and grew. So from oh, there was one other okay. thing, though. <laughs> Another evangelistic thing that we started right at the beginning was the block party. We, we would, we would um, partition the whole Bonita Avenue right there, block it off. No traffic could come in. They had a big trailer. Um, what was that, Stitches or something? Yeah, Stitches, yeah. Stitches, yeah. 
Anyway, it was, it, we had all kinds of games and comedy skits going on and toy giveaways. I couldn't believe, what, who's buying all, these, all this stuff? But anyway, it was a very big success um, as far as our evangelistic endeavors in our beginning. Mm -hmm. So from 1997 to 2018, under the Francis and Susie's ministry, The Rock grew from over, over to over 1,500 people with up to six services a weekend, utilizing our Vernon and, and Bonita campuses, plus the Magic Circle Theater. Was there anything else? Oh, the Tower Theater, not the Magic Circle? Okay, all right, in Roseville. So it was a wild ride. How many of you were here at that time during any of that? Yeah, so it's awesome. So it was a wild ride. We sent out hundreds of members also to start three new local churches over the years, and Mosaic Church in Rockland is actually one of our churches that was no longer attached to us, but it's a great church still going strong. So a couple of years before Francis retired, he began raising up one of our rock interns, Brandon Naramore, whose family was also at the church, a great family, and he was our youth pastor. And he became our new senior pastor. We knew the Lord was calling us to stay and support Brandon in his new ministry. A year and a half in, COVID happened, and there was a lot of... Um, you know, churches having to shut down. So there was a lot of things to face, but in spite of the challenging circumstances, we were proud of our church family for their support, and the rock really came through it with flying colors. A lot of churches actually closed down. I work for City Pastors Fellowship too, and that's with all the churches in Sacramento, and, and just a lot, a lot of churches had to close down through that. So a lot of things got shaken up. And there was a lot of changes also. Just with any time you have a pastor, uh, pastoral change, there's just a lot going on. But the rock held firm, although many of our members shifted to other churches at that time while we were closed. So that was sad. Amen. So as we look to where we're at today, the worship, the preaching, the freedom of the Holy Spirit is producing a wonderful atmosphere of love and fellowship here amongst us, and we're excited about that. You know, you know I was just thinking back as I was sitting there today, I, I believe the church is just as healthy today as it has been at any one of the stages we have been through, and then, and then that's because of all of you that are here today and how you've been responding to the seasons that we go through. And because of that, you know, we're able to enjoy the warmth and the fellowship with each other and the Lord and, and see what God is doing in our midst. We skipped one paragraph, so I'm going to go back to it. And so, so at every stage, the rock... <laughs> huh? You skipped a paragraph. Let oh, me I go did? back. Yeah. Oh. So when Pastor Brandon <laughs> stepped down, the baton was passed to one of our elders, Pastor Sean. And we're so proud of the way Pastor Sean and Josh Marlowe stepped up and led us in the wake of COVID. It was a lot. Yeah. A lot. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and help the church feel secure and stable during this new transition. I could cry because truly it was, um, it was an amazing thing how you just took over and that's a lot to bear and you were working a full-time job, you have four children, a wife. I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot. So kudos you know, to you and to Josh for, for doing that. And then when Pastor Aaron joined the team as co-lead pastor, he added his own strength to the team. And I'm always telling Aaron, I gotta tell you, I'm always going up and giving him hugs because I've known him since he was 15 and just telling him, Aaron, I cannot even begin to tell you how proud I am of you. <laughs> He's done a great job. At every stage the rock has been through, we've been so blessed, really, to be an integral part of what God is doing here. I mean, it, it, it has not been, you know, some people look at our lives, how could you stay through all that? It, it really wasn't that big of a deal. You know, when you just simply respond yes to the Lord, he makes things a lot easier. So we're so proud of our leadership team and the church and everyone putting their hand to the plow and seeking God's kingdom first. I believe the present season we're in is re very rewarding as we look forward to all that God wants to do in the future. Amen. 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 
So uh, Pastor Francis didn't mean to be here today. Uh, he actually fell ill, and so he wanted me to tell everyone that he loves you, he misses you, and he'll be here at a later time to, uh, to love on us as a congregation. Amen. Um, wow, that was great. Thank you guys so much for sharing that. Um, now we, we kind of want to shift to some of what God is doing in our, in our community. You want to speak to this? Yeah, so we got to hear some of the history of, you know, where God started the rock and how he's taken us through a lot. Um, but he's also still here. He's doing stuff in this body now. Um, and we wanted to give you sort of a glimpse, even as this past sermon series, we've been giving you guys a glimpse of what he's been doing in our body, how he's been moving. We wanted to highlight that today as well as we're celebrating 27 years. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to ask, it's Jessica, right? Yeah, Jessica, come on up. Welcome her. I do remember your name. I was just making sure I was getting the order right. <laughs> Um, I feel better having both of you up here with me, too, by the way. Um, it's very bright up here, so I, um, this is very uncomfortable for me. It's, it's very out of my comfort zone. Um, I've been coming to The Rock for about six months on a regular basis, um, and I just wanted to share, um, I wanted to share a little bit of my background uh, because God had to do some serious work for me to stand here today. Um, I came from um, a family of addicts, and um, I, I, I myself, you know, struggled with my addictions. And um, <clears throat> I, I had to fight. I had to fight to, 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 to bring myself out of it. Um, and, and, I know, like, I wasn't, sorry, give me, give me just a minute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a minute to breathe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so for the time, from the time I was 15 to about six or seven years ago, um, I was, you know, in and out of uh, mental institutions, um, in and out of different different addictions, um, my body started to shut down. Um, I was very much a shell of a person. Um, I couldn't look you in the eye. I couldn't hold a conversation with you. Um, I was absolutely terrified. Um, I went through, you know, um, I was really weak at that time, so I went and I got um, taken advantage of by someone that I thought loved me. Um, and I lost all sense of self, and the sense of self that I did have was really, really fractured. Um, so I, <clears throat> I, um, I had to fight, and I know that, like, the things that I survived through, like, the Lord was there through all of that, or I wouldn't have gotten through it. Like, he was at works, he was at works even then. Um, even when I didn't see it. Um, and it's a shame that I, I felt like I had to carry it alone. Um, and if I knew I didn't have to carry it alone, um, it might have not taken me so long to pursue a relationship with Jesus. And uh, through the last six years, um, I've been able to piece my life together. But it's been a fight, and I have went at it alone um, with all I had. Uh, determination, trauma, fear, uh, doubt, um, inadequacy, I had to fight, um, and alone, um, or at least I thought I was alone. Um, and I know, like, throughout the last six years, um, I've had some people here that, that they were warring in the spirit for me um, and for my relationship, and I'm so, so eternally grateful for that. And... Um, you know, through that six years, I, I kind of had to, I had to rebuild myself, and I was working really hard, and I had a lot of external things that were attached to my value. Um, I was working three jobs. Um, I thought the more that I bought, the more I succeeded, the more I performed, that, that increased my value somehow. Um, my value was not focused on, on being a child of God. 
Um, I was complacent in not wanting to understand it or define it coming from a 12-step program. Um, that was, you know, that was one of those things that I felt like I was, I was being pushed. I was being pushed to define it. Um, and it didn't make sense to me. And I really, really struggled with it to the point where I started to get resentful. And, um, you know, I grew up in a family, we didn't talk about God. Um, my, my family was very, very fractured. Um, and <clears throat> it was, uh, it was shortly after finishing the 12 steps of, of this program I was in that um, I had, I had something happen to where all those things that I had attached to my value, my job, my status, my employment, my um, everything, everything that I thought made up me, it got taken away. <laughs> um, and I had to go through four months of rejection, um, just rejection after rejection after rejection. Nobody would hire me. Um, and I thought I was at risk of losing everything that I worked so hard for. And that was like, that was terrifying. That was terrifying. But you know what it did? It pushed me to, it was met with resistance at first, but it pushed me to trust in a way that um, I hadn't had ac access to before. Um, but I had to have this moment of like absolute, like I am desperate, I submit, I am not in my will. Um, I cannot do this. Like I cannot do this alone. I cannot do this alone. And um, he, he had to put me through it first though, because it, it did not come easy. That submission did not come easy. Uh, but I'm so, so grateful. I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for that time and I didn't see it. Um, and you know, after that four months and after like, submitting and just paisley threw myself on the floor like i am yours just do with me as you wish um i i got the job of my dreams um i have a beautiful home i have a beautiful husband i have beautiful dogs um, and i had to pull myself out of the darkness and i had to fight my way out um, and I wish that I would have pursued this relationship sooner because I've got, I've been missing out. <laughs> I've been, <laughs> I've been missing out, but, um, the mercy of God was always there. Like I always had his mercy. I was always cared for. Um, and he pu he pulled me out of that. He pulled me out of that. Even though I didn't see it at the time, like he, he, it was him. It was him. Um, and sheer determination. <laughs> um, so coming to the rock in roseville um i already kind of had some some roots here some people that are really really important to me here and um, i remember i was in a depression pit and i didn't want to get out of bed and i was i was literally rotting in bed and my my legs started to feel like they were on fire like i couldn't i could no longer like just like lay there and just like take it because i was i was just literally laying there suffering um and thinking about how inadequate i was um <laughs> And I got invited to the fire starters and I came. Um, and it was around the time it started is like when my legs felt like they were on fire. Like they felt like I was like, I was starting to get antsy. You know, like when you just feel like there's this like tingly sensation in your legs. Um, and I came and Aaron was here and I got, I got absolutely rocked. <laughs> like I got absolutely rocked. Um, I had some people pray over me and um, you know, coming into the rock, I, I was very much, I, I very much still had that well in me. Um, and all the things that have been taken away and all these external things that I had attached to my value, they've been replaced with so, with so much love and so much joy. And like allowing myself to feel that joy is, it's, it's always been so vulnerable. Uh, but knowing that I don't have to carry that alone and knowing that that is a gift of, of our Lord Jesus, then it, it, it allows me to allow it. <laughs> it allows me to allow it and it allows me to, to sit in that and, and deserving and having my identity attached to being a woman of God and to be healed and to be restored in my mind, my, mind, my body, and my spirit. Um, I have been restored. I have been restored. That was also very uncomfortable. <laughs> um, 
yeah, so it's, it's a trip, like just thinking about all the things that I had to go through and all the things that, that, Lord, that the Lord had to break off of me for me to turn to him. Um, and unfortunately, I'm really, really stubborn. So um, it had to take something. It had to take something drastic. Um, and for me, being a doer, achiever, overdoer, um, I, was, I was choosing to be lost in that. I was choosing to be lost in that. Um, but that, that severed the connection between you know, community, connection, the Lord. Um, it, it, sev it severed that, and it separated me from that. And that's what the enemy does, right? They, it wants to keep us isolated. It wants to keep us isolated and away from community um, and the lies that we're led to believe through, you know, going through something that was um, as traumatic as, you know, drug addiction and abusive relationships and um, the orphan spirit. I grew up, you know, in a very unmanageable, chaotic, fight or flight, get out of the way household. Um, and, and having to unlearn all that, it takes some serious courage um, and it takes sitting with some stuff that's really, really uncomfortable um, because for so long I tried to avoid all that discomfort and it almost destroyed me. Um, and I think from the mercy of, of Jesus and, and my community um, and my 12-step program, I've, I've been able to, to come out of that on the other side. Um, and I'm, I'm after that relationship. That's what I'm after, because the more, the more that, that develops, the more I get freedom. And um, I just wanna, I'm so grateful that I got asked. Oh, and my birthday's on the 27th, so this is kind of cool, it's kind of perfect. <laughs> Um, so there was a lot that Jessica covered in her testimony, but I feel like there's just a moment uh, here for us to pray and respond to the Holy Spirit. If you identify with what sh some of the stuff she mentioned, the, the isolation, the self-sufficiency, specifically the, the self-sufficiency that's rooted in the like needing to prove yourself, prove that you're worth it, prove that you're adequate. If any of that resonates with you, can you just lift your hand really high, lock the elbow? So family, if you see somebody with a hand lifted, um, just put a hand on their shoulder. Um, and I'm gonna ask just to pray for, pray for you guys, just that what the Lord did in her life, he would just do in yours. I'm praying. You're praying. Yeah. <laughs> praying. Oh gosh. Oh, oh. Dear Jesus, um, everyone with their hand raised right now, um, having that having that commonality of feeling like we have to uh, feeling feeling like we have to prove ourselves or feeling like um, our worth is dependent on something outside of being a child of God or our identity is wrapped up in something that is false that is not from you and anything that is not from you um, is false. <clears throat> And Lord God, I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you, and I want to release everyone with their hand raised right now from um, distraction and avoidance and remind them that they are worthy and that they are loved and that they don't anything that they're carrying right now, they don't have to carry that alone, Lord God. They do not have to carry that alone. Uh, they, you only have to hand it over and know that anything that you hand over, the Lord can handle. And you don't have to keep that, you don't have to keep that all to yourself. You just hand it over and you trust. And to trust means to hand over anything that is worrying you. If you're not, if you're worried, you're not trusting in Jesus. I remind myself of that often. If you're worried, you're not trusting in Jesus. Even if you're going through something difficult, there is a lesson and there is a gift on the other side of that. You might not see it right now, because it might be really, really painful. You might be struggling financially. You might be going through a loss. But know that whatever is taken away will be replaced with something so much better. So much better. You just have to let go and let God and know that you're gonna be cared for. Amen.
guys ready for another testimony? Yeah. All right. So we gave you a testimony of time. Uh, Ken and Lydia uh, shared actually a nice little timeline of how we got here today. I wasn't expecting all that, but that was amazing. Uh, Jess shared about internal transformation, the things that are going on uh, in her life uh, because of her involvement here. Just to dive a little bit deeper, again, she said six years of, of being involved with folks who actually go to The Rock. Um, and it wasn't really about, hey, come to church. We want to get you to come to church. If we come to church, something. no, no, no. They walked with her for years before she ever walked into this building, which is a beautiful thing. This is what we're called to do. Right, guys, take the church out of here. All right, this, is a, this, is, this is a decently nice building. I get it. There's nothing to see here, okay? It's you. It's you that people need. They need Jesus Christ in you. Right, that'll bring them along. Amen? So the next testimony that we want to, uh, to bring up is my friend uh, Jesus. So he's going to talk about just what God has, has been doing in our local outreach. So come on, boy. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Ah, I feel the anxiety. You're right. So, I'm Jesus, for everyone that doesn't know me. Um, God, this is a beautiful church. So, I want to start my testimony about, let's say, we'll go a couple years back, probably around two years back before I started coming here. Um, I had met my wife, started having... You know, we had beautiful kids and all that stuff, but I had a really rough upbringing that I pretty much brought on myself. I, a lot of gang activity, a lot of, um, just a lot of nonsense, you know, what comes with all that stuff. And so I was running from court dates. I was running from just life itself, because I knew that I had dug myself in a pretty deep hole and that it, there was a huge climb to get out. And basically with that, my wife came to me one day and she was like, you know what? It's getting kind of ridiculous. You gotta get a gotta get your head on your shoulders because we got a family. You know, and it was impacting my driving at the time. It was impacting, you know, me getting a job because I can't drive or this and that and just on top of everything else. So um I started my my journey. So I started getting my life back together and with that, I was also realizing that I needed to search for God in that. I wasn't really totally committed to it. I wasn't totally faithful, but I was like, I need to find a church. So I was searching for churches. And um, honestly, came around some really kooky stuff in that search, and I stopped for a while. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I actually ventured off into a cult one time. I, I swear to you, it was a cult. And they would, Seemed like really nice people, I promise you that. And I brought my mom to it. God bless her soul. I, I couldn't believe I had did that. But, you know, you live and you learn. So now I'm, so I stopped for a while. I worked on my achievements for a while. I started getting my stuff back together. I'm getting things done. I'm, I uh, got it myself. You know, it sounds crazy, but I got my driver's license not even that long ago, maybe two years ago now, and I never had one in my life. So, um, what, <laughs> thank you. What came with that was a job, a good job. I had jobs and they were all, they all paid well, but I got a good career going now. And with that came, okay, my next step was we're buying a house. So I get this house and <laughs> I remember paying 1800 for a duplex in Rancho and this mortgage was, it's still, it's still through the roof. It's over, you know, $3,000. And I was just like, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're doing it. So that was one of our biggest goals and it's still one of my biggest goals to the day. Um, so I get this house. So let's fast forward. I get this job before where I'm at now. And I'm thinking life is great. You know, I, and I still am on a pause with my search with God because of that stuff that happened. And... Basically, through that, I'm thinking I'm great. You know, uh, my 
boss told me, you know, December 1st, we're going to give you a raise for all the hard work you did and all this stuff. And I'm just like, wow. And then next, you know, December 1st hits. My boss calls me into the office and there was like seven of us. So I'm like, oh, hey, you know, we're all getting what we deserve and we're going to be good. <laughs> he fired us. He fired all of us. <laughs> I'm not even, it's, and I'm laughing now, but I'm telling you, I was destroyed. I, I, just, I wanted to say so much, but I bit my tongue. I was just like, I can't believe it, right before Christmas. So that, it did destroy me in smaller words. So after that, I remember I was like, you know what? I can't do this with God. I need to get back on that horse. I need to go find a church with good people, right? So I came here probably once or twice when I was a kid, and I was telling Amy this morning, I, 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 we, I remember walking up the stairs, and there was like a room up there, and I want to say like jungle theme, I don't know what it was, but I remember, and I've been thinking, because I haven't got that confirmation, I'm like, man, I think I'm tripping, but no, the, I, she told me today that there was a theme up there, and that we used to, that it used to be up there for the kids, and so I'm like, you know what, it, okay, so I'm babbling, so I come to church, I was like, you know what, I remember this church, Rock of Rose, well, I think I used to go there, I'm going to go. And um, this experience happened almost instantaneously from walking in the door. I remember walking in the door, and you guys, people standing in this room were just, hey, how you doing? And I'm just like, hi, you know? <laughs> and then it's like, well, what brings you in today? I'm just like you know, uh, God, you know, and oh yeah, well, what's your name? And I'm just like, hey, Seuss, what's your name? And, like, yeah, so like, <laughs> and, uh, and it wasn't just one, it was one after another, after another, after another, coming in just to get into the, just to get here. And I'm like, wow, okay, this is different. Okay. And I was with my mom, so I remember sitting like somewhere right over here, and when we came and sat down, and it's crazy, it makes me, I swear to you, I seen Sean and, and Amy when we walked in, and I told my mom, I was like, there's something about them. I don't know what it is. And I just, like I said, I have no clue who people are here. This is my first time. And my mom was like, I think so. I think I feel something about them too. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to make it a point to say something to them on my way out. And I remember coming up after, and I remember, you know, introducing myself. And they were, they were you guys are so kind. I swear to you, they're just so kind. And... I can't really remember what I said, but I told them, I was like, someone's drawing me to you guys, and they're like, you know what, let's pray, right off the bat, let's pray. And I remember praying, I'm just like, God, this actually feels good. The, the comfortability of coming to a church and feeling recognized for once felt good. So they prayed, we prayed. I drug my mom out, she was crying, she was having like this, you know, um, big old spiritual overcoming. So she was out there crying, I dragged her out here. And I was like, you're here to pray with me. So we prayed and she, uh, she was, <laughs> no son, no, no, you're coming, come on. And then we prayed. And um, after that, I remember Amy sitting there and I, like I said, I had just lost my job. I have no income as of that for. I got Christmas coming up. I got my mortgage coming up and it's all on my wife now. I have nothing. And Amy's sitting there and she's like, hey, so you, you want to get some presents for your kids? We got this, you know, fun drive. And I'm just sitting there like, oh, don't you do that to me. <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'm still in my pride. Like, I don't even know her. And she's asking me if I want to take, if I want to get presents for my kids. And for a moment I was like, Eminem, I'm choking. <laughs> you know what I mean? I am choking. I, I, and I'm sitting there just frozen. And she's smart, man, I swear. She, she looked at me and she's like, okay, let's reword this. She said, um, would it be a blessing if you had more presents under your tree for your kids? And I said, of course. Of course that would be a blessing. Once I said, of course, that would be a blessing, and, you know, she said, okay, next week you come here, and we're going to go from here to this place, you know, and it's Bonita, and we're going to get you some presents. I'm like, what? I don't know her. I don't know him. 
But yeah, the, the first day I meet you, you're already offering me, you're already basically helping my family out to a point where I can't help my own family. If that doesn't say something, I don't know what else does. Seriously. I did not know them at all. I'm, I'm, and not just telling I'm tatted up. I don't even remember how I was dressed. I'm sure it wasn't very proper. Um, and they opened up. They opened up. And that's the key factor that this place, this building, there's something more than just a church here. It's, it's a family for sure. And without all of you guys chipping in, I don't think I would have came back. Once I got, I came back the next week and we did the service and I'm still like, I don't even know what's, gonna, what's going on. And she's like, all right. She came and grabbed me, she's like, let's go. And then I was like, okay. Awkward, but let's go. I still don't know them, but let's do this. And then they took me over there and I'm talking about, she, she grabbed a bag and said, fill it up for your kids. You're thinking a bag. I'm talking about a tr the heavy duty trash bags for construction, like this tall, fill it up. I got, you know, three kids at the house and she's like, give them a couple of each. Not dolls, not, I'm talking about scooters. I think I grabbed a, a, a drone. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not playing. I was grabbing stuff and I'm like, well, this is for us to take. I was like, I never even flew a drone, but we're going to do it today. Okay, so I grabbed the drone. I'm grabbing all this stuff, and I'm like, you know, this is amazing. This is more than a blessing. And um, I knew from that moment forward, I would never in my life take advantage of the situation that was just presented to me. I knew it was God. I knew it was God. I feel so lucky to be here in front of you guys. I got my cousin here. I, I, it's been a journey. I love you, bro. It's been a journey bringing my family in. I got someone that, you know, I'm, little by little, I bring more pe people with me to show them because every time they come, they're just, they're, they're, their jaws drop too. They just can't believe the love you guys have here. You guys are the rock and roll, like Sean said. You guys are what brings people back. God's here and he's gonna have his arms open for you and I just wanna let you know, this is my story and how it's impacted me and I hope it lays in seed in one of you guys as well. You know, let's give a round, big warm round of applause to these guys in the Rock of Roswell. <laughs> Got Sean and I crying up here. <laughs> just a couple of things I want to draw our attention to, just even from the last two testimonies, is, um, and Sean even touched on it, but uh, so much of what the Lord does as, as an expression of this community, does in this community, has so little to do with what happens on a Sunday morning here. Yeah. Um, and in a church culture, and I'm just talking about broadly in America, that puts a lot of emphasis on what happens on the stage and a lot of emphasis on who has the microphone. It can be really easy to think that when you just come in, you say hi to a few people, it can really be easy to think like, does what I do matter? Yeah. And it wasn't like, we, we're, we're a church that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pursue the gifts, we pursue the miraculous, we do all of those things. And it can be, in that environment, it can be really easy to think, unless I'm doing that, seeing big crazy stuff happen on a regular basis, it can be easy to feel like, does my high, does my handshake, does my smile mean anything to anybody? You just heard two stories that prove to you resoundingly, yes, it does. And even in that, um, it, can, it can be really easy to sort of force something to happen in your own strength for a year, maybe two years, maybe three, if you're really committed to working yourself to the bone and ignoring you know, the Lord asking you to rest. But... For, for something like this to be happening consistently for 27 years. 
God's doing something. God's doing something. And we just get to be a part of it. Amen. Even the baby said amen. Yes. Um, so or earlier this year, I got an opportunity to go somewhere I didn't want to go because Bob made me. Um, um, he called me up and said, Sean, I have a softball for you. All right. I want to get you to Haiti. It's the perfect time of year to go to Haiti. All right. Like great weather. And it was. It was great weather. It was great. Um, but when I got there, I got to meet uh, just an incredible, an extraordinary man of God. And, um, and so just through the relationship that we developed in my time while I was there, um, man, I just got such a heart for that area, a heart for the Haitian people. And uh, so I reached out to him this week and wanted to know if, he, if The Rock has been a blessing at all to him. And he said, I would love to send a video. So we want to share uh, something from Elvis from Haiti. Good morning, my brothers and sisters and guys. I greet you today from Pleasance, you see Haiti, with a heart full of gratitude. My name is Elvis Guillaume, and I have the blessing of leading the Guillaume Foundation, named after my late father, Leopold de Guillaume. I want to take a moment to thank your church, Rock of Roseville, for all you have done for our community. Your kindness has changed life here in Blazers. In 2016, after Hurricane Matthew, many of our churches and homes were destroyed. But through Pastor Bob and your generosity, all 12 churches were rebuilt. Now, over 18 families have received a place to call home. In 2022, when an earthquake destroyed our village and our school, you are there for us again. The first floor of our new school is now ready and we will soon welcome our students back. Many homes were built. You did not stop there. You built a children's ministry where over 500 kids come every Sunday to worship and hear God's word. Your support is helping shape the future of these young hearts. And just recently, you have provided motorcycle for our pastors, making it easier for them to travel the long distance to reach their church and share the gospel. Look ahead, we are planning to train our new pastor so God's word can continue to reach more people. This is our next big project and we believe it will happen with your continued support. Your love and your generosity have brought hope and we need it most. Thank you for everything. Thank you for loving us. May the Lord bless you, your family, and your church for all the way you are blessed. God bless you. Oh, man. It's such a blessing, again, to to be a leader in this community, uh, to be here with you all. Um, I Many of you guys are familiar with my story, but um, all I ever really wanted was a family. That's all I really wanted. Um, was abandoned kid, neglected kid, and I grew up around a lot of family, but you know, it was dysfunctional. I don't know you guys know a lot of what that, that looks like. And so the church has become for me really an area for God to redeem so much that was wrong with my life growing up. And so 
um, just being here with you, being able to be here, to be here with you, uh, Aaron, it means everything. So we love you guys. We truly do. We're so thankful to be able to, uh, to lead uh, in this community. And so here's, here's only, do you have anything you want to share before we go into the next part? Just to share a similar sentiment. Um, I did not think when I, uh, came to this building for the first time in 2009 that I'd be pastoring here 16 years later, 15, 16 years later, I can do math. Um, and even Sean's word at the beginning where God's telling him he's going to be blessed. Um, it can be really easy to get caught up just as a pastor, as a leader, it can be easy to get caught up in all the different things that need your attention, but just to watch the hand of God over literally decades. Yeah. And just to see even in my own life, like I, I came here as a former cessationist Baptist kid who, you know, thought, you know, the movement of the Holy Spirit pretty much died when the apostles died. And I come in the middle of this awakening and I'm seeing the Lord do all this stuff. And this was the, this house is the house that created a space for me to realize that God's more than a theological idea and actually pursue him. Um, and to see how he's worked everything out is just amazing. So I'm blessed to be doing this with you all, going, going after the Lord together. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, okay. Yes, no. I think I cued you on that, so thank you for <laughs> responding. Um, you know, it, it was really cool to just hear kind of a, a similar theme uh, from Jesus, uh, because when I first came into this building uh, many years ago, same thing happened. I encountered this man at the door who I just remember saying to Amy, man, that guy's really friendly. Man, their, their door greeters are anointed. I remember putting our, our kids in childcare, and then that guy walked on stage. It was Francis, right, who did that. Um, and so God is good. Amen. God's good. This is, this is a house, and I've, I've heard this over the years. I've seen it while I've been here, and I experienced it myself, that this, you know, there's a lot of amazing churches in this area, a lot of really, really good churches. I know uh, many of these pastors, they are, they are incredible men and women of God that lead these churches uh, in this region. And the Rock of Roseville is kind of this hidden gem. It's just this, this hidden church uh, that people come to to get healed. For whatever reason, people come here, they get healed, and God kind of sends them off. Um, and so I know that's what happened for me. I, I've seen it happen. A lot of people have talked about how it's happened. I, I know so many people who say, I used to go to The Rock, which actually is a blessing to me. I'm, I'm good with it. Amen. So we want, we want to share with you guys, um, as we've been working for the last two years, again, two years uh, into a transition, you know, we really felt like, I remember coming on stage two years ago and saying to you guys, um, I feel like God's telling me that we just need to completely reboot. Yeah. We need to just reset a lot of things. There's a lot of things we need to tear up. We need to tear things down to the studs and rebuild. And I remember, and I didn't know what you guys would say to that. I, you know, I was ready for tomatoes to get thrown. I, I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> you know, but everyone said, all right, let's do it. And, uh, and so we wanted to be prayerful about it. We really wanted to hear God on it. We didn't feel like we needed to rush this thing. And so, um, so we just sought the Lord, and we've been seeking the Lord for a long time. Aaron and I have had many, many conversations. We sat with our elders with this, uh, Dr. John, um, who is amazing at this. He's gifted in, in the area of, of consultation. He's spent a lot of time with us. And so we want to share with you guys our mission. Are you ready for it? Yeah. All right. So let's unveil, let's unveil our, our mission. So here's our mission. Our mission is restoring the broken to hope and wholeness in Christ. This is why we exist. This is why we exist as a church. That we are here and, and this, is, this has layers. This is what we want to see in ourselves. 
This is what we want to see in this faith community. This is what we want to see in the neighboring communities. And it's what we want to see all around the world. Everywhere God would allow us to touch, we want to see this happen. Amen? Yeah. And so we're excited to run after this. Um, everything we do will be an attempt to accomplish this as we move forward. Amen? Amen. 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 And so do you want to speak to that? Yeah, and as we've gone on the process of really just trying to define you know, what our mission is and to try to boil it down, any of you who've done anything in a corporate world know that you can pretty much just slap a sentence together and put it up and it can mean very little for what actually happens in the day to day. But as we we're actually going through our church's history, not just about, you know, where we think we're going, but looking through, even as Sean said, you know, what's God been doing in our community? And even if you look at the stories that were shared this morning, and if many of you have the same story, and he said it, like the amount of people that come to the rock for a season after having walked through something, whether it might've been with a previous church or walked through something in life, they come here and they just find a place where for whatever reason, what the Lord's graced this house to do is be a place where people can do just that. They can regain hope and they can get whole. Like that's not just an understanding about where we want to go, but that's as best we could. We tried to name what's the unique anointing that God's put on this house. And it's that. Yeah. Amen. So I, you just reminded me of something. So there is this, I forget his name, but a pretty well-known um, Pauline scholar. This is a guy who studied the life of Paul. Um, and, um, and so someone came and they began to ask him questions about Paul. And they said, if Paul were here today, if Paul were here today, what would he say about the things going on? Like, what, what would Paul uh, say? And he said, oh yeah, easy, two things. Okay, was it? He said, number one, he would be shocked that he was famous. Shocked. He'd be shocked that he's famous. And number two, he would be shocked that any pastor believes they can lead any more than 12 people. Um, and, and I say this because, and you usually don't say this from stage, but I don't think I care. All right. <laughs> Here's, here's the deal. Um, I do not want to pastor the internet. Now, if you're on the internet and you're watching, God bless you. We love you. <laughs> Good to see you. But that's just not really in my heart. Like, I, I, don't, I, I really don't want to go viral. I don't really care about that. But you know what I want? I want to be in a community of people that I know by name. And so if this church blows up, we'll, we'll go to God with it and figure it out. But if we are blessed to do life with you, if we are blessed to grow with you, to mature with you, I'll give my life for that. Amen? Amen? Let's move on to the vision. All right. So we wanted to kind of do a more, a more full readout of exactly what we think God's doing uh, here. Um, and, uh, and this is how it goes. In five years, the Rock of Roseville will be a vi vibrant, life-giving community where emotionally healthy, spiritually mature, and mission-driven disciples of Jesus thrive. Every member will be deeply rooted in God's word, grounded in the love and support of our community, and equipped to bring the transforming power of Christ to a world that is yearning for hope and healing. We recognize the challenges before us, spiritual stagnation, lack of biblical knowledge, and a need for deeper empowerment among believers. But we also see these as extraordinary opportunities for growth and renewal. And so our vision is clear. We are committed to becoming a church where every life is built on the firm foundation of God's truth and every person knows their role in God's plan, ready to step out in faith. Yeah. So imagine a church where people stand firm in faith during life storms because their lives are anchored in biblical truth. 
Imagine a place where conversations are marked by honesty, vulnerability, and love, where we embrace hard discussions without fear of division, knowing that we are bound together by something greater than ourselves. Imagine a place where every member is equipped to walk through pain and challenges, not in isolation, but with the strength and support of a united community that reflects Christ's love. And so to accomplish this, we would like to see 75% of our congregation complete the Emotionally Healthy Discipleship course as part of our new spiritual formation pathway, ensuring that we are a community grounded in emotional and spiritual maturity. We will add eight deacons with shepherds' hearts to guide and support the ministry, sharing in the leadership, and ensuring that every member receives the care they need. Through our School of Supernatural Living, we will equip every person to recognize the spiritual needs around them and respond with the love of Jesus. Picture this, picture members of The Rock being able to share encouraging prophetic words with neighbors they see when they check the mail. Members of The Rock laying hands on coworkers and seeing them healed at work. And our children praying for their friends and seeing miracles, knowing that God works through them in powerful ways. We believe the whosoever believes invitation of John 3.16 is a treasure that we must first embrace deeply before we can share it with the world. Our journey begins by cultivating spiritual health within ourselves, and as we do, our love for the world will naturally grow. And so as we turn our focus outward, we see our immediate neighborhood, the Cherry Glen and Thiles Manor communities, as a mission field ready for renewal. Thiles Manor uh, currently has the county's highest poverty rate and the lowest high school graduation rate. This community is also marked by homelessness and spiritual emptiness. And so we will partner with local leaders and organizations to help transform this community as we work together to reverse these troubling trends. In five years, we envision a neighborhood full of hope and opportunity where families flourish and children have the chance to thrive. Beyond our neighborhood, we are called to the world. In five years, we will be a thriving community of mission-focused disciples, each of us confidently living out our God-given purpose to make an impact. Together, we will see lives and neighborhoods transformed as people turn away from the unstable foundations of culture, false religions, and self-reliance to find true strength and identity in Christ. As a church, we will be deeply rooted and unshakable grounded in scripture, passionate for God's presence, devoted to one another, and unwavering in our mission to reach the world. This is the future we'll build, we are building. Will you join us? Um, just spending some time with the Lord. So we're going to have the ushers. You guys can go ahead. We're going to take communion together. So ushers are going to pass around the elements. And our worship team, you guys can come back. We're going to wrap up here. Um, as I was just spending some time with the Lord this morning and thinking about uh, this moment, an opportunity to share the vision with you guys, God reminded me that there's still honey in the rock. That's right. Right. That life is a wilderness. But there's a rock in the wilderness. Okay. In the wilderness, you meet God. Right? And God has put us in a place with each other where we get to rub against each other. And sometimes rubbing against each other, it hurts. It's hard. Right? We get offended. Right? It gets difficult. Right? But that's the place where we meet God. Amen. And if you stay long enough, if you stay long enough, what you're going to find is the miracle that there is honey in the rock. Shauna, you and I were just talking about that this morning. There is honey in the rock that God is going to show up in incredible ways in our midst. Uh, and it means everything to be able to do that with you guys. Amen. You know, even as we're getting ready to take communion, um, something that we've been endeavoring to behind the scenes, just Sean and I and a group of us as we're stepping into 
you know, what does it look like to follow God, even in an emotionally healthy way, in a way that takes into account, you know, what's going on inside of us? How do we take that and offer it to the Lord? Um, part of one of the practical ways we've been doing that has actually been silence. That there's not just within Christian history, but even in scripture, there's something even about the wilderness that Sean mentioned. One of the things about wandering out into the wilderness, even if we look at the life of Jesus, it says that the spirit drove him into the wilderness. One of the things that is distinct about the wilderness is there's nobody else there and there's no noise. So and even I'm thinking there's scriptures running through my mind right now. Let, let all the earth be silent. Keep stillness before him. Um, and even just before we head into communion, um, I would just love it if as a church we could just have a few minutes of just silence and thankfulness for God. Um, there is an appropriateness sometimes when the Lord reveals himself, reveals a measure of where he's going to take you, where it's okay to not have words and it's okay to just sit there and say, God, thank you. So before we take communion, I just want to invite us to a couple of minutes of just going to that place, just silent stillness before God, just in thankfulness. So Jesus, even as we prepare to take communion today, God, everything that we've talked about, everything that you've done, everything that you're going to do, it's only possible because God became a man who chose to die. Jesus, we just declare again that Jesus, you are the reason we do any of this. Communion with you is what all of this is about that you are actually restoring the world back to yourself. And we as a body, we as the Rock of Roseville are just a small piece of how you're doing that in the earth.
Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken. Thank you for your body that was broken, the stripes that made room for our healing, your body that was broken so that relationships wouldn't have to be, your body that was broken so that we could be with you again. So we take the bread and thank you for your body, Lord Jesus. Uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in a house with my grandma and a few aunts and a boatload of cousins. And whenever we would sit down for dinner, we'd have a table uh, full of all of us. And one thing that my aunt knew is that if she gave us our drink too soon, we would drink all the drink and we wouldn't eat the food. Anyone know what that's like? And so what they ended up doing is they would take our drink and they would put it on the counter and they would line it up on this just small little pink cup. They put it on the counter, they would line it up and we couldn't drink until we were done with our food. Now you probably feel that way because right now you're waiting for me to let you drink the juice. And, and so it trained me, it actually, like even still to this day and all my friends, everyone who knows me knows that I never drink until I'm done eating. I'll eat all my food and then I drink. Um, and so it just makes me look forward to the drink like you are right now. And so, but I just want to say this, I think uh, we live in a world that uh, tries to tell us what to do with our lives, right? That the world um, is going to try to tell us that we need to save our lives and we need to savor our lives. Save your life. Don't don't take any risks. Don't 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 do anything too crazy, right? Just save it. Just come and be careful. Don't don't do anything. Or savor it, right? Really cherish it. Enjoy YOLO, right? Just do whatever you have to do, right? But then the kingdom of God breaks in. And through the life of Jesus, we see another option, which is you can also spill it. You can spill your life too. Jesus said this in Matthew 26. Um, starting in verse 27, it says, Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so as we take the cup, I want us to remember and God gave me this word probably a year, two years ago, but it keeps bringing it to mind that a life poured out is not a life wasted. A life poured out is not a life wasted. We are called to give our lives away. And it's nothing that God is asking us to do that he hasn't done himself. But then Jesus says this, he says, I tell you in verse 29, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my, uh, my father's kingdom. I will not do this again. I want you guys to think of this moment. He's with his friends and they're, and they're drinking together. And he says, hey, I want you guys to know something. This won't happen again until my wedding day. Savor this moment, because next time we do this, it is going to be amazing. It's going to be the greatest day of our lives. And so this is reminiscent of, you know, have you ever had your, your mom was in the kitchen and she was baking something. She was baking a cake or brownies or something. And she takes it, she whips it with a whisk or a spoon, and then she pours it in a pan and she puts it in the oven. Have you ever gotten the spoon? That mug was good, wasn't it? And, and it was a down payment. It was, it was a way for you to know how good this is. What you're going to get that comes out of the oven is better, but just take a taste for now. And so as we take communion, I want us to all remember this is just a, this is just a moment. It's a down payment. It's just a spoon. But there's coming a day we're going to be in the kingdom with Jesus. We're going to be at his wedding. 
and all the drama, all the hardness, all the struggle, all the disappointment, it'll be worth it on that day. Can we drink this together? Amen. So we are going to be here. We're going to be praying. Um, if you still need to receive prayer, please come forward. We'd love to pray for you. If you want to just kind of be here in this environment while the Lord's moving, that's you're more than welcome to do that. Otherwise, be blessed. Rock. And here's to another 27 years.